I, I did um, I did recognize a few names um, on the cohort list. So some of you may have taken classes with me, but uh, I hope maybe you will. Anyway, um, so like Angel said, my name is Maria Rowlett, and uh, this is my 13th year teaching here at CSU. And I'm also a graduate student um, or an alumni, I should say. I did my undergraduate here in psychology and I did my graduate uh, degree here and also in consumer industrial research, which is a, pro a program that no longer, no longer exists. But uh, so I've never really left CSU. I find it my, it's my home. So uh, I do a lot of research. I have been, uh, usually have ongoing research at all times. So uh, I've been through what you're going through. I've been where you are in that, uh, and have no idea what I'm doing in research. So hopefully I can explain it uh, from uh, a way that you can kind of understand and, and hopefully get excited about the concept of research because you know I always tell my students, uh, you may not think that you're going to do research in your future, uh, but everybody is going to be able to be on the receiving end of research uh, in, in every discipline. So, um, you know, might not conduct it, but you're always going to be reading it or being uh, getting your information that's based on research. So uh, it, knowing the process uh, kind of makes you a better consumer of research, but also makes you a better researcher. So in whatever path that you choose, um, it's gonna be very essential. Um, I just spent some time uh, with a, a firm that does a lot of job placements and uh, recruiting. And uh, they said, one thing they always look for on a resume is research experience uh, because of how it really kind of uh, expands into life, everyday life besides just going to, uh, you know, doing, going and doing research. Uh, so it's really, really important um, if you can get some kind of experience in research. And there's lots of opportunities here at CSU. So I'll touch on that a little bit. So I'm going to share the screen. I have a couple of slides uh, to show you. Um, and hopefully this will help um, guide you. And uh, I told Angel, anybody who wants a copy of this is more than welcome to it. I would, I'll have, be happy to send it to you. Um, the, uh, it's not too long, but it kind of highlights, sorry, I'm, I, I can't walk and chew gum at the same time. So <laughs> when I'm trying to do something, I can't do it and talk. Uh, so this kind of just highlights uh, the, the whole research process from start to finish. Um, please interject anytime you want to. If you have a question, I'm, you know, I will be happy to stop, put it in the chat. Um, I've got everything right in front of me, so hopefully I can uh, I can pay attention. Or Angel, you could flag me down. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, this is an interesting uh, quote that I found, and I find it so relevant. Uh, in that research is something that everyone can do and everyone ought to do. It's simply collecting information and thinking systematically about it. So again, this is something that you can do. Uh, I don't, you know, a lot of people think, well, I'm not, I don't know how to do it. I can't do it. You can do it. Uh, and hopefully at the end of this presentation, you're gonna feel uh, some, you know, some sort of excitement, if you will, about research. Um, you're all, hopefully, I don't know if any of you are, are familiar with it, but really what research stems from is the scientific method and the steps of it. Um, can everyone see that okay? Okay. Um, and, you know, again, uh, I'm here representing all genres. I'm not just, just because I teach in, in the uh, psychology department, doesn't mean I'm just going to talk psychology, but really the root of research starts here with a scientific method. So I geared this presentation around these six steps because that's going to how I'm going to outline the process. Because in your doing the research, uh, you're going to go through each of these steps and it kind of will highlight uh, what you need to do. Um, to put forth uh, your research project. Um, the first thing that we're going to talk about is the first step, which is identifying a problem. So how do you come up with an idea for your research? Okay. And this is the best, this is the, the most frequently asked question. So I try to tell students there are, you know, a lot of different ways that you can uh, come up with ideas. So I want to review a few of them. I mean, there, there's more theoretical ones as well when you get a little bit more advanced. 
But when you're first starting out in research, um, the, there's very simple ways to come up with an idea. First of all, you want to look and, and uh, you know, determine an area of interest. So simply look at the world around you, okay? Um, what questions on a daily basis, what do you ask yourself um, while you're working, uh, you know, while you're relaxing, while you're uh, traveling? Any, what do you ask yourself sometimes when you look around? I don't know if any of you are people watchers. I am a people watcher. And I enjoy just watching people and engage in everyday life. But when I do that, I tend to, you know, put that there, not therapist, the maybe the researcher head on, say, I wonder why the, people do this. And I wonder why people do this. Um, or I wonder how that affects something else. That's kind of how, uh, in a very basic way, we tend to get at least an area of interest. It might not be uh, in research format yet, but we get an idea. Um, then what we tend to do is, and this is where uh, students kind of get a little intimidated, is review the literature. And, and that's really, uh, you know, the internet and the resources we have now are obviously endless. So what we encourage students to do is once they come up with just an idea, you know, an area of interest, um, is to go to the literature. And when I say go to the literature, uh, Cleveland State has a lot of online research databases that are uh, full of research journals. And we'll gear you in the right direction, but we'll, we'll say, do you do a lit review? And all that means is you'll go to a search engine and you'll put in some keywords. So say you're interested in uh, something about self-esteem. OK, um, and, you know, nothing other than that. Well, you can go into the search engines and you can type in keywords, just various words of interest to you. Um, you know, you might have some interest in academic achievement or you might have some, uh, you know, thoughts about how self-esteem affects academic achievement, or you might be looking at something other like, uh, you know, the weather and how it affects people's moods. You know, there's tons and tons of ideas that we can pull up. But, but when I say go to the literature, what I want you to look at is see what everybody else has done. See, see what other researchers and other students and other faculty, you know, the, the, the pool is endless, have done in that area. And, and what students uh, get in, uh, are confused about is that um, that that uh, re that sorry the previous literature is there to encourage us to give us ideas. Uh, replication is key uh, in research. Replication of of research is not copying research. It is it is looking at how somebody did something originally and taking it and making it your own uh, with your own sample. Uh, so. Uh, we expand on research. If you think back to that first slide that I showed you, that scientific method process is circular, right? It is a continuous process. So we'll do research and we'll finish our research, but we'll finish it with leaving it in a sense open-ended for somebody else to pick it up and do it again. Uh, there's no finite or uh, finality, I should say, in, in research. It's continuous. It's not linear. Uh, so we can pick up ideas from what other people have done. So the literature, which is all that scientific knowledge that's out there, um, is at our disposal. And we're going to review it. And, you know, there's, there's, there's kind of some tricks along the way of how to review it. You don't have to sit and read, you know, 20 page articles. There are some shortcuts along the way of what we can look at. And then I'll show you those uh, in the next slide. The, the key objective in that literature review is that you can develop new ideas that can be converted into a hypothesis that's interesting and novel. And, and that's the key right there to research. And I'll explain that. Uh, I'll define that a little better uh, in a minute. Um, but the one thing about reviewing the literature, and, and so you find an article that seems of interest to you, um, it's first you're first presented with what's called an abstract, which is the summary of of the article. So that kind of will, between the title and the abstract, should kind of grab your attention. Then I always suggest to students, go all the way to the end of the article and read what's called the discussion section. And, and this is when the researcher kind of reflects on what was done, what was found, and what could have been done differently, okay? And uh, 
a lot of researchers will go ahead and make an implication for future research in concluding their own research. Okay, so it kind of leaves the door open. I always tell my 412 students when they're writing their uh, paper, I said, when they're writing their discussion section, I said, I want you to write this discussion section to next semester's students, uh, in a sense, so that when they're searching and struggling for an idea, you know, what would you tell them as just gone through this class? What would you tell them about your research uh, that could give them an idea of how to take the same idea and develop it? So that kind of hits home with them because it's they're paying it forward, first of all. <laughs> and second of all, it just is it, it's lessens that anxiety of I've got to find the perfect idea. Um, the other thing is what we call methodological sh methodological shortcomings. And, and this is um, the method is how research is done. What tool do we utilize? And a lot of times if we tend to we, we could tend to use uh, tools or a procedure or participants that just don't work. And uh, as a researcher, we will full disclosure in our discussion section, we'll say, you know, we did this, but, you know, this didn't work and this tool wasn't effective and maybe I should have used something with higher reliability and so forth. So, again, you can pick up from their shortcomings and that's not a negative thought. That's just a way. That's why the research continues, because times change. Uh, society changes, cultures change, uh, trends change, all this stuff in society changes. So we always have a, a reason to do research again. So uh, that's that's a key piece of, of uh, what to look for. So um, you want to identify your area of interest, like I said, and search the literature. And what you're going to do is eventually, as you search through the literature, you want to narrow your search. So think of the inverted or upside down triangle, where at first you're in a sea of a whole bunch of ideas. That literature review, um, and again, it's it's really just done all mostly online uh, because of of how technology has expanded, old and new. Um, and so as we go along, we can narrow our search um, in that literature review. Uh, then what we finally do is we select an, uh, an idea, okay? And when I say I, an idea, I don't mean just one, you know, like self-esteem, just an idea of something that uh, you question, you know, or something that you would like to know uh, how they relate or the effect that they have on each other. Um, and that will eventually lead to what's called a research hypothesis. But before that piece, okay, and this is the hardest part, but this is the most important thing to communicate you, to you right now, is you as a beginning researcher, uh, as a college student, um, you know, I'm sure some of you have various jobs, but when you come up with an idea, it has to be an idea that's what's called observable and measurable, okay? And this is key. Um, we all are interested in different types of research, but we don't always have access to different populations of people that could give us that information. Uh, for example, I, I often get a lot of people who want to look at the uh, research in PTSD. Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder is a very, um, uh, very well-researched area um, for different reasons, and it's a very interesting area. Um, and we have great research on it, but unless you have access to, to a sample of people who have been diagnosed with PTSD, it's probably not the most... Uh, reasonable or the easiest thing for you to research the first time out. Now, it's not to say some of you don't, okay, um, but don't choose a population of people that you, you can't access, okay. Uh, I had another student once who was really interested in the prison population. Again, I said, unless you have access to the prisons, because you really need that population to collect data, you need to access them to ask them uh, questions or get, gain information from them. So unless you realistically can access them, um, then don't choose that kind of population. It makes your life very difficult. And aside from that, there's a lot of different uh, ethical guidelines and, and different types of uh, uh, approvals and, um, you know, 
things that we have to red tape, if you want to call it that, that we, we have to go through. So think when you're thinking of research ideas, think about something that everybody, you know, that everybody uh, has or encounters. We all have self-esteem. We all have uh, maybe depressive symptoms. We all have anxiety. Um, but, you know, we all have, it doesn't always have to be that heavy. Um, you know, we all have moods. We all have different, uh, we have memories. We have, you know, thoughts and, and experiences in our life that maybe we can expand on. But uh, keep in mind the population that you want to ask and make sure that you have access to them, okay? That's what observable is, okay? And then measurable is, okay, so you want to study uh, something about that population, then you have to think about, well, how will I do that? And can I do that? Um, one thing we don't do, and, and Angel, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, for beyond psychology, is one thing we cannot do is we do not do any research on anybody under the age of 18. Um, because we have strict rules about, you know, child participants. Yes, uh, under age participants. Okay, yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of fascinating research out there about early education. And we've all, like I said, that's usually very accessible. But unfortunately, without special assent, we cannot use anybody under the age of 18. Um, but, you know, other than that, you know, you have you have a pool of, of, of college students at your disposal, okay? You probably have a job where you have uh, coworkers, you have friends and family, you have connections through social media now, uh, which, you know, that in and of itself is just changed the whole research world. Um, now, we have to be cautious with some of these um, ways that we access participants, but the point here is that you know you just have to be, have access to them and you have to be able to either indirectly or directly measure what you want to measure okay and uh that's something just takes some thought and then we help you develop that so once once we develop or define those two pieces okay when you come up with an idea then what you're going to do is develop what's called a research hypothesis and if, if you don't know, a research hypothesis is basically just your a specific, specific testable claim, or it's just a prediction of what you expect to observe, okay? So what we're basically doing is we're gonna collect a sample of people and we're going to measure some sort of behavior or uh, phenomena. And that data is gonna answer uh, a question that we asked originally. And so what do we expect the answers to be? What do we predict we're gonna find? Um, and you can align this a lot of times with what prior research has done, or you could say, you know, prior research has looked at, you know, this, uh, phenomena, and I'm going to look at it too. And this, but this is what I expect to find. Okay, so you can align with what research tells you, you can also think, I really think it's going to be different now. So, you know, the, the research is there to help you develop your idea. And, and then from that idea, uh, they can help you or I can help you, we can work and developing that research hypothesis. Um, and that's the point here on the triangle. We got the new ideas, we really go through that literature pretty thoroughly and, and it does take a little bit of time, but then you come out with a, a, a testable and measurable research hypothesis, which that right there sets your um, study in motion. So once you, while you're doing this, there's really two important um, questions to ask yourself. And, and this, I know this seems far, far fetched at this point, but you know, I've worked with students a lot who have submitted uh, some of the research to different publications um, and different uh, seminars and conferences. And the, the one thing that I've, I've gathered from editors and advisors and people who are the ones who are selecting these uh, articles to be published or to be presented is two things is, is my um, idea interesting is the first question. So, you know, is it interesting? Can it benefit society? And, and don't you don't think you can't research something that can add to the scientific body of knowledge. Any of you can do that. Um, 
is this a test of prediction or am I going to develop a new area of, of research? Now that might seem a little bit far-fetched too, but you all have the potential to add to the scientific body of knowledge by doing some research. Um, and again, somebody else might pick up on that uh, someday too. And, you know, an idea that you may have uh, originated and so forth. Um, so journals prefer to publish papers that are going to be widely read and useful to their readers. Uh, if we can put some practicality or applicability, uh, you know, making it beneficial to the times right now, um, then you have put yourself ahead of the pack um, uh, because you've made your idea more interesting. And then the, the second one is, is my idea novel? And this is, this is a little difficult to explain sometimes for, uh, for students to understand. This is not, you're not gonna read Invent the Wheel, okay? What you're just doing is taking existing re research and putting your own spin on it. You're making it a little fresher and newer. No one's gonna probably come up with anything you, that hasn't been researched before. Um, we have very few areas that haven't been researched, um, but you know, we have things that are new, social media, is one of them. We don't have a lot of research. Now it's building over the years, but relatively speaking, it's new. So it's being um, recently, you know, more recently re uh, researched. The newest, COVID, okay? I mean, it's still amazing in the short period of time how much research we have had coming out of what has been going on in the world for the past year. But you know, we, there's a lot we don't know because it hasn't been researched enough. And I'm sure you've all heard that before. Uh, if you watch the news, there's just a lot we don't know. Um, so the novel idea is one that's original or new, and you have to be able to show how your idea adds or builds upon that scientific uh, body of knowledge. So what kind of makes yours different or stand out? Um, and that's what those editors uh, look for, or advisors. Uh, they look for that uniqueness in a sense, because um, they are researchers too. So they know what to look for. So those two pieces are really, really important. So that was step one. <laughs> Luckily, there's only six steps. <laughs> um, okay, so you got an idea. Okay, and, and you've talked to your advisor and you've kind of talked it through. It's, it's observable, it's measurable, so now what? So, you know, we're gonna develop a research plan. We're gonna find out how we can test or how we can answer the question that you originally came up with or how are we gonna test your uh, research hypothesis? Again, the first step is, is your plan doable? We're not gonna let you go ahead of it, ahead if it's not doable, okay? So, you know, that we talked about. Then you have to think of, okay, what, what exactly am I uh, looking at? What am I testing? What are these variables, okay? Now, the, the definition of variable is something that can change or vary across time. Uh, again, think of things like self-esteem, um, aggression. Uh, these are a lot of um, more psychological ones, but we also get, you know, testing, um, uh, academic achievement, uh, pa past trauma, drug use. All of these are different uh, types of what we call variable. Uh, and, but the, the hard part about variables is easy to come up with one, but it's, it's very difficult to what we call operationally define them. In other words, this goes along with measurement. Um, you know, if I'm measuring aggression, okay, so they say one of your variables is aggression. So how would you measure aggression? Okay, so if you think about it, if you had to go out and, and, and you got 10 people together and you wanted to measure how aggressive they were, how would you do it? Would you ask them about uh, how aggressive they are, which is a, basically a self-report method, or would you uh, do some kind of observation uh, type of uh, situation where you would watch them in a certain situation to be able to observe their uh, aggression? Okay, um, and that's, it's not an, uh, an easy answer uh, or an easy question to answer because we tend to rely a lot on these, what we call self-report where we ask everybody about it. But if you're a real uh, educated person uh, and you're highly aggressive, are you gonna tell people you're highly aggressive? Or uh, are you, if you're studying, um, you know, drug use, are you gonna tell people you use drugs? So, you know, we have to keep that in mind and making sure that we can get the best measurement possible 
for, uh, for that particular variable. So the operational definition is just looking at the variable and saying, what is, what is it that we're looking at? What are we looking at to measure aggression? Or what are we gonna ask them to measure aggression? The good thing is that, you know, because we have so much uh, research in, in historical research that um, we are just, we have a wealth of, of surveys at our fingertips that are well-established, reliable, and valid. So when it comes to operationally defining variables, the best thing to do is find something to do it for you. In other words, find a scale that measures depression, find a scale that measures self-esteem that's already been established and used. Uh, and, and that scale is what gives you the characteristics that you need to measure. And that's what operationally defines your variable. It's a little bit of a confusing concept for some, uh, but really it comes down to just finding a good way to measure the best way possible that you can think of, and that's practical uh, for you to measure that variable. Um, then after you kind of solidify that, you got to think of the who. So who are we going to ask uh, to get the answers to our question, or who are we going to ask to make this prediction? So uh, a couple things you need to think about is again. Uh, you know, who do you have access to, okay? Now, we talk, if any of you are kind of familiar with the research process, keep in mind that, that everything we research is, is basically an estimate because we don't really have access to a lot of po complete populations, okay? So remember, population is, is a complete set of everything, okay? Um, so if we're talking about something self-esteem in college students, okay, our population is going to be all college students. Um, and then we have what's called an accessible population, okay? Um, or a target population. It's the population that we have access to that represents the overall population, okay? So uh, that's just something to keep in mind because again, you might be representing a general uh, population, but you're really accessing a sample, okay? And that's where we gather our sample from is from who's around us and, 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 and where are we gonna get these people from? Um, so the sample that we gather, okay, is basically the, um, you know, the people around us, the, the people that we have access to that can represent that sample. We have to be careful sometimes because we could be very limited um, in, in who's around us and we're, we're leaving out people that should be in that sample. So there's some techniques about sampling uh, that we'll review if you do research to say, okay, maybe you should go beyond the college campus because you need people who are a little bit older um, or have different jobs. Um, in the behavioral sciences, it's predominantly female. So a lot of times, if you look at the college campus for your sample, uh, you're gonna get a very heavy sample that's female and not as, proportionately not as many males. So that you're, you know, you gotta kind of keep that in consideration. You're also dealing with people around 18 to 35 um, and you're leaving out older populations. Maybe that's okay, but maybe it's not. So different things we need to consider about where you're finding your people. Um, but usually, you know, if you're on a college campus and you're living the college life, you probably want to research something regarding college students. And, and, and in that case, it's, you know, it's perfectly fine. Um, so we have to find people. So this is just an illustration that really helps kind of just you know, I'm a visual person, so I like to see uh, how the process works visually. And uh, so to kind of summarize what I just said already, identify the behavior or event of interest, okay? Then you have to ask yourself, can it be directly or indirectly observed? So do we have access to the people? If you say no, then you, it's not scientific and we need to find a new idea. Uh, if you say yes, well, that's great. So now we're going to go on and find if it can be measured. So, uh, you know, can it be measured with a self-report? Can it be measured by observation or interview? Uh, if, again, if it's no or just seems like something that's uh, not doable for you, we're going to move on and find another idea. But if it can be done, we're going to go ahead and then kind of start by up defining that behavior or event and, and seeking out that scale or that technique that can give us a good operational definition. Um, so am I still on step two? Sorry, I always, my screen's always in the, my uh, 
my pictures are in the way. <laughs> so we're still talking a little bit about uh, you know, developing a plan. This part is a little hard because you need to learn a little bit about different designs. And I'm, you know, this is not a, a 312 course necessarily that I would uh, spend too much time on. But uh, basically what you need to do is develop a, a research strategy and design. And, and this is what Psych 312 is really um, designed around, just talking about all the different designs and possibilities that you have and how you can just, uh, how you can conduct your research. Because it's not just a, it's not just a one procedure where you just do this and you get an answer. There's a lot of different variables that need to be explored uh, to decide. But the good thing here is that um, usually your hypothesis um, and your variables kind of define this uh, already. So it's not like you have to go about thinking, okay, I, I have to explore all these different ideas. Tell me what you want to research and how you want to research it and what you want to find. And usually it falls into a design. So it's almost the opposite. We find the design, the design doesn't find us. Okay. So we just, we find it by how we decide we want to conduct our research. So we can put that in place relatively simply. Um, Two things to consider uh, when you're doing research is the distinction between quantitative and qualitative research. And if you're not uh, familiar with uh, the difference from a research point of view or from this point of view is that the quantitative research uses that scientific method that I started off with to record our observations, but it records them numerically. And so there's some numeric index to the information that we find. And we usually do this with surveys that are quantified. In other words, uh, if you look at a survey, you're asked a question and you're, giving a, you're given a numeric index to answer it, like strongly agree or strongly disagree. Usually it's like one for strongly uh, disagree and five for strongly agree. So we have a we have numeric data at the end of the day, okay? Uh, and, and that's very uh, easy to analyze. Um, this is the most common uh, type of research in behavioral sciences because the data um, is there, it's numeric, and it allows us to, to give a more objective analysis um, and observations, and it keeps out uh, bias. And, you know, if you're familiar with biases, you know, again, we're trying to, we're trying to, but to, to answer a question based on facts, not based on thoughts, feelings, um, experiences, judgment. We want what the answer that we get to be completely unbiased. And most feel that, that we can do that uh, most unbiasedly, if that doesn't make sense, uh, but by using quantitative research. However, there is, there is a, a purpose for qualitative research, which is where you uh, assess information, but we get it non-numerically. Um, and so conclusions are drawn without the use of, of statistical analyses to a point. There, there are a few out there that you can kind, of, uh, can kind of work. But qualitative research is, you know, think about it when we were talking about aggression. If I want to measure aggression, I could, you know, give somebody um, the Bus Perry scale, which is a scale that me measures aggression, the self-report scale. So I give somebody a survey and ask them about their um, aggression. That would be quantitative. But I also could have do a different situation where uh, we do this a lot with um, uh, early education when we're looking at aggression in children. I could be just an observer of kids playing on the playground and I am uh, just observing different behaviors. Uh, that tends to be a little bit harder to quantify because I'm just looking at for different situations. Um, the, the analysis on, on qualitative research is more of a narrative. Uh, it's what a lot of therapists use uh, when they are working with research with, with different depressed uh, patients. Um, you know, they, they ask questions, they interview um, about different situations or um, experiences. The information that they're getting is, is qualitative. There's no numeric data there. So we tend to look at trends and overlaps and, you know, just things that, that we see overall uh, that we could uh, qualify uh, without using numbers. So for the most part, I, you know, 
not many people do much qualitative re qualitative research anymore. Um, it's difficult, like I said, to analyze. It's also very time consuming um, because where you can get a hundred participants with a survey, you can get one or two with an interview. Uh, so, but it, it definitely has a, a place in research and it's definitely has its advantages. Okay, uh, one thing I'm gonna touch on and I could, I could talk all day about this part, but um, you know, once you develop your idea and then you develop a research plan, um, we have to gain approval for your idea uh, through the what's called the Institutional Review Board. It's the IRB. Uh, every institutional has an IRB that receives funding for research. Okay, so uh, what we need to do as uh, researchers is uh, we have to obtain approval, and so. Uh, for basically it's for the ethical treatment of humans and animals, but we only, you know, use the uh, human part of it. But we have to submit a proposal that uh, outlines all the details of your study and how you wish to accomplish it. And it really focuses on the treatment of the participants. Um, what will they be asked, uh, how they'll be treated, um, you know, and, and what the data collection process looks like. Um, it is a very, uh, 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 very specific and uh, very, uh, it's a little bit of a lengthy process, but for a good reason. It protects you as a researcher. It makes sure that we're not violating any kind of ethical guidelines. Um, because, you know, if any of you know anything about re historical research uh, that's been done, we've seen a lot of bad research out there uh, from many years ago, like the Milgram study or the Stanford Prison Study, um, the Tuskegee Airmen Study, which has come back into light now with, with the pandemic. Um, there's a lot of historical studies that were done where people were treated very inhumanely. And uh, so we have developed a set of uh, ethical guidelines that change constantly um, because society changes and people change and uh, so forth. So uh, the IRB uh, it consists of a committee of, um, of people who are some who are experts in a certain area, some lay people, uh, sometimes you get people from outside the university, so you get a very good uh, exam, uh, examination of your process. And they will look over it with a fine tooth comb. They usually will make some suggestions of how you can do things a little differently. Um, but uh, you know what they try to do is assess if there's any kind of risk involved in your research, and what students tend to um, think is, well, you know, I'm asking them about, um, you know, their mood, and uh, you know, or self-esteem, and there's no risk there. We don't always talk about physical risk. We talk about the psychological and emotional risk of some studies, and so according to the IRB, uh, there's. There's no study that has no risk. Uh, there is always a little bit of risk because of, of what the emotional toll it takes on people. So that's the kind of process uh, that we have to uh, go through. It does add a couple weeks to the whole process. So uh, if if you're going to do some research, after, you know, once you develop your idea and design your uh, proposal, then it does need to go to IRB for approval before you can collect data. And uh, you cannot collect any data until it's approved by the IRB. And then once it's approved and you go collect data, you, uh, you have the responsibility to follow the, their, their protocol and make sure that you stick to everything that you propose to them uh, in the first place. So it's a very important process. And at the end of the day, it protects you and it protects the uh, participants. Step three then is to to actually conduct this study. Okay, so we got we got an idea, we developed a hypothesis, um, and then I have uh, uh, the IRB's approval. So now I'm ready to go. Uh, so again, we wanna like, execute some kind of plan so that we can, can conduct the study. I, uh, again, some of this is repetitive. We're gonna make sure we have our sample from the right population. Um, and, you know, hopefully try to, uh, represent the population as best as we can from which how we're getting our sample. Sorry, my thing. Um, so then we have to start thinking about data collection. Okay. So, um, you know, who, so, you know, again, we've developed a sample. So who are they? Um, and 
what are we going to use or uh, what measures or materials or instruments are we going to use to collect the data? Are we going to use surveys? Um, do we, are we going to conduct interviews? Uh, do we, I need them to watch a certain video to us to, uh, you know, to establish or, or create some kind of response? Um, how are you going to do this? You really have to sit down and think, okay, let me take it through in my head. Um, a very, you have to have a very detailed idea of, of what you're going to do before you actually do it. Um, the the uh, a goal of a researcher, or there's many, but you want to anticipate every possibility of what can happen in data collection so that you get the base, best data possible. So you really have to give it uh, a lot of thought. Is it a sure thing? No. It's never a sure thing. And that's why we continue research because we aren't gonna know if something doesn't work until we actually do it. So, uh, you know, if we're using reliable sources and we're looking for surveys that have uh, some, you know, reliability to them and we're, we're, we're looking at studies that have been done using the same type of measures or the same type of procedure, you know, that's, that's what we do. Um, we're doing things in the right way. They just don't always work out because we that's why we test things so differently. Um, two, two really important concepts that you need to remember um, in research is uh, reliability and validity. And again, words you've probably heard many times before, but uh, all aspects of your research are going to be assessed either by the IRB or an advisor or an editor for uh, credibility, okay? You as a researcher want to be, to have credible, well-designed research. And again, it doesn't mean that it's, everything's guaranteed to work. It just means you, you set it up with the right guidelines in mind. And so our measures, for example, well, we find measures, we find different scales that measure aggression and self-esteem and so forth, but we wanna make sure that they're good and they're reliable. Um, Reliability is basically is a consistency or, you know, how stable, how well used is, is this measure or this technique. Um, and because that adds credibility to us, we're using a credible uh, source. We're not just finding anything or we're not just making a question. We're, we're using a, a reliable uh, scale to measure self-esteem. Um, so there's different kinds of reliabilities, test, retest, uh, which again, you know, it's when you measure something again and does it work the second time like it did the first time um, or internal consistency. So again, do all the items measure what they're supposed to measure on a scale and are they related? Uh, these are things that are easily accessible in the literature so we can find out how valid something is or how reliable something is. Um, validity, again, um, does the measurement for the variable, does it, uh, or the construct as we sometimes call variables, does it measure what it's supposed to measure? Okay. Um, did were the questions asked? Did I get to the to what I what I needed the information? You know, there's a lot of scales out there that you would think would measure self esteem, but in 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 you know they may not, or they might not measure self esteem in the way that you define felt self esteem or what you're thinking about in terms of your uh, thoughts for the research. I've had students many times say, you know what, I don't think I'm thinking self-esteem, I'm thinking this instead. I didn't realize that, you know, I, uh, that's not what I wanted to measure. Let me look for something else. And it happens because you really have to look at those scales and say, is this measuring uh, what I wanted to measure, but then is it the best measure of that, that construct? Um, again, there's, this is, you know, trying to, I'm trying to hold back and giving you a whole lecture <laughs> about design, but there's just common designs out there that uh, are very doable for a first time uh, researcher. And the most common being the survey research design, where basically you use a survey um, to, to measure your variables, okay? I'm looking at the effect of uh, self-esteem on uh, academic performance. So I find a survey, say I find uh, the Rosenberg self-esteem scale. Okay, great, it's got a high reliability rating that measures self-esteem. Um, and then all your data is collected by surveys. And that's usually um, the best way to get a lot of data. And um, uh, because in, in, in sometimes in research we say power in numbers because you know you the more, the closer your sample is to the population in theory, 
uh, you know, the, the, the closer we are to the actual, because everything we do is, a, is an estimate. Um, but then there's two really uh, two schools of thought when it comes to how you're going to uh, look at your uh, situation or your research. You can do it what's called an experimental design. Experimental design is uh, that looks truly at cause and effect, that one variable causes the other. Um, in order to, 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 to say that, uh, you have to have three elements, um, which is randomization, manipulation, and comparison control. Uh, randomization is uh, really how we select our participants. We wanna make sure that they're randomly selected. Okay, and, and sometimes we have to randomly assign them into different groups. So th that word randomization for some is, is key. It's the only way to get an unbiased uh, representative sample. Um, manipulation is kind of where we take that independent variable, the variable we're looking at it, and we, we, we break it down into different levels. Uh, it's called a manipulation. Uh, the best example of, of, of a research, experimental research design is, is if are, you're measuring the effectiveness of a new therapy on depression, okay? So you wanna see if my, you're, you're the developer of this, this uh, therapy and you wanna see uh, if it has an effect on reducing depression. And so uh, the drug would be considered my independent variable, okay? And depression would be my dependent variable. So what, what, I, what I wanna manipulate is I'm gonna take uh, and select, randomly select 50 people. And I am going to take 25 of those people and I'm gonna put them in a group, but I'm not gonna give them a drug. So they're gonna be called the no drug group, okay? And then I'm gonna take the other 25 people and I'm gonna put them in what I call a drug group. So that 25 people gets the drug, okay? And then I'm gonna measure each group's depression. And at the end, I'm gonna look at two sets of depression scores, one from the people who got the drug and one from the people who didn't get the drug. And I'm gonna compare those. And that's kind of the analysis part of it. But randomization came in because I randomly selected them and then I put them in, I put this people in, randomly put them in one of two groups, the drug group and the no drug group. The manipulation is the creation of those groups. It's, it's kind of a, a confusing word for that. It's basically taking my 50 people and I'm manipulating uh, the uh, drug groups, if you will. And then, so half of them are going into the no drug group and half are going into the drug group. That's a manipulation. And then comparison and control. If I'm gonna measure the effectiveness of my therapy, I'm sorry, I went between therapy and drug. If I wanna measure the effectiveness of my therapy on depression, what's the best way to, to look at it? Well, don't do it and do it. So you measure those differences. And that's what's called a comparison group. Uh, so I look at it without and I look at it with, okay? Uh, and that comparison, uh, that no drug group kind of gives you a baseline. So you have something to compare it to. So that some, in some uh, research uh, schools of thought or realms, people feel that the experimental research design is the only true research we have because it's the only thing we have that, that truly uh, demonstrates cause and effect. Um, so uh, for a lot of you, that's the goal, right? Is to, uh, to look at something and, and be able to say at the end of the day, it's, uh, A caused B. But how we establish our, our uh, our research and our um, ideas in a sense is through correlational research where a correlational research just looks at how things uh, what we call co-vary or how they are related to each other. Um, and we, we see it, the, how they react in different patterns. How does one variable react to the other? What we cannot conclude from correlational research is that uh, we can't, uh, conclude causation, because just because things are related doesn't mean that one causes the other, okay? So when we start out looking at your data and your stuff, and we'll start to analyze it, we first just look at it and see, are these variables correlated, okay? Um, and then once we establish that they are related in some way significantly, then we can go and look at it in an experimental way as well. So I know this is a lot, but it just kind of talks about um, what we can get out of the uh, research and what we conclude and what we can, what what uh, conclusions we can make. Um, but uh, so that that's something that's explained uh, in the process. Um, and then step four, um, and this is a good lesson for everybody in statistics. 
um, probably the one most hated class <laughs> in psychology, but I, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. Once you collect all your data, however you do it, uh, then it's uh, your job to then analyze it and evaluate it and make sense of it. Um, you want to summarize it and represent it. So uh, we're hoping it's numeric data. If it's not, we're going to try to make it numeric. Uh, how are we going to present our results? Uh, how are we going to analyze it so that we have something to present? Um, data, we tend to report it different data in different ways. Uh, we do it, try to do it in a visual piece. Uh, or graphically, um, but usually it comes up as an American index or a statistic that we have to in interpret. Um, we have uh, very specific guidelines uh, that I haven't talked about yet, but uh, the APA, which is the American Psychological Association, uh, every year you know, has a set of guidelines that we follow in terms of research of how, how we do it, um, how we write it. So, you know, uh, when it comes to the analysis and the interpretation of data, we do follow very closely the APA guidelines. Um, but the first set of statistics that we look at are those um, that are just very descriptive. They, they make sense of a large set of data. Uh, things like uh, the mean, the mode, the median, those are all descriptives because they just take a large set of data and they put it in perspective for us, tells us an average with the mean. Uh, the mode, what, what answer happened the most, probably many, um, and the median, which is just the true middle score. Um, you know, uh, we look at frequencies. So, uh, you know, here's my exam scores and I wanna see how many of each score everybody got. You know, those are all, those are all statistics, but they're just very limited in what they tell us, okay? Um, but at least at a glance in a visual way, we can see the some patterns or we can see where scores are, 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 get, are, are more frequent or clustering or you know, uh, centering. Um, so we look at uh, our data with a descriptive uh, set of statistics, but then what we do is then we go into more inferential statistics. And these are um, the more, uh, you know, inferential statistics are those that you, we can make inferences from. We can, we can generalize, we can, we can make estimates of a sample and we can apply it to the population, okay? Can't do that with descriptive statistics because we're limited. Um, descriptive statistics really give us more information about populations and, you know, just limited information about a sample. So we're gonna use uh, more inferential statistics uh, to get the answer to that question that you asked originally. Okay, the data, we're gonna take the data, it's gonna go into, you know, magically it's gonna be put into a, a program called SPSS and then it's gonna come out with a numeric index and that one numeric index has to give you the answer that you need. So um, we're gonna use certain criteria uh, to decide on what statistic to do. And from that statistic, because you know there's different statist uh, st different statistics for different designs, so we're going to make sure that uh, we look at the situation and evaluate what's best, and and run it um, and come up with that uh, that answer. Um, once you get that answer, it's going to help you understand uh, with some training. It's not always going to be easy, but you know we'll, we we. Uh, you know, with some statistical knowledge, it doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to have a major in statistics to understand these things. It just requires a little bit of explanation, but you're gonna see if, you know, if whether or not your variable had an effect on something else, you, you're gonna see whether your variables are related and that would be correlational. Um, you might see if your variables are different amongst different groups um, of observations, or for some are they different and from are the same. So, you know, what we look for in data, okay, is differences because, you know, like I was explaining with the example with therapy helping depression, and I had the no therapy group and the therapy group, okay. I hope as that developer or the researcher of that therapy that I see a big difference between the no therapy group and the therapy group so that I know my therapy worked, okay? Um, you know, you're always gonna see slight differences, but am I seeing big enough difference for me to conclude that the therapy worked? And I can't do that without the use of statistics because we can't at the naked eye just look at 
raw differences and be able to make that conclusion. Um, and that's really important to realize. Um, but we have very specifically designed uh, statistics that will do that for us. Um, so statistics should, um, man, my, it got missed on me here, sorry. Uh, statistics should be, you know, again, they're going to help you substantiate your findings. They're going to help you say objectively, factually, okay, without bias, what you, what your data has telling you, what you have found, okay. So um, it's, you know, a lot to consume, but it's very, it, it could be easily done and understood. Uh, Maria, um, question. Yeah. Sorry for interrupting you. Um, when you are talking about statistics, can you give us an idea of uh, the numbers behind statistics, meaning uh, a comment on, for example, the sample size and how that relates to uh, sure. trusting our numbers? Yes, absolutely. It's a very good question. Um, we 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 tend to look for power uh, in our in our results, right? We want we want uh, we, it's called an effect size, but we want some magnitude. We want some, you know, good results. And so we have a little saying that we say is like power in numbers, right? So if if you think about it, you know, again, your sample is is representing a population, and that population could be millions of people. Okay, and so you have a, collected a sample. Now, if your sample is very small, okay, and your and your and your population is a very large, proportionately speaking, it's going to be hard for us to see any significant results from a small sample that doesn't really represent that population well. Okay, so it's easier said than done sometimes. So we always say the larger your sample size, the the closer you are to the to the actual. Remember what we what we compute is an estimate, but we're we're representing the, the actual if we knew it. Okay, so our sample size needs to be large enough so that one, it could be as uh, unbiased as possible. And that, that has to do with design, making sure you select the right people the right way, because you want your sample to be a good non-biased representation. But you also wanna make, make sure that your sample size is large enough uh, so that it, it one, kind of regulates the differences in people that you have so that we get a, the best uh, representation uh, of, of the population, but also then it adds more power to your analysis. In other words, you're going to get uh, more powerful results based on your uh, on your sample size. Okay, does that answer that, Angel? Uh, yes, thank you. Are you sure? <laughs> We, we have a benchmark. I mean, it changed. Everybody has different researchers have different opinions. We, we try not to, to analyze anything below the sample size of 50. Um, and but again, it's hard to say because you could be looking at a population that's relatively small or, uh, you know, you might have very specific uh, uh, research hypothesis where you can't you're not going to get a large sample size. But for the most part, uh, for what in psychology we tend to research like self-esteem and, and, and aggression and all those where everybody has one, right? Everybody, so that we tend to try to be a little bit more realistic to say, yes, well, you know, we could be, we could be looking for a lot more people. Um, and we do what's called a power analysis. And it's, it's basically an anal a pre-analysis that'll say to you, based on what we know, um, this is how many people you should have to get in, in a, an effective result. Uh, and, you know, sometimes, you know, researchers will be like, or students will be like, I got to get that many people. Um, so, but you, you know, the, you want that outcome to be as powerful and, and as effective as, you know, as possible. So uh, power numbers. So a okay. good question. Um, communicating the results. So you've, you've done, you've done your analyses, you've gotten uh, your results, your numeric results. So, uh, and you've, inter you've, you've interpreted them. So now what do we do? Uh, well, the best thing for you to do is to communicate those results. So, you know, let other people see what you've done, what you've worked so hard for. Uh, let professionals, advisors, faculty members, friends, family, see what you did. Um, we do this in a, in a lot of different ways in, in uh, psychology. Um, one, the most common is the written piece because we, we write a manuscript. Um, a lot of you, uh, if you go into uh, do summer research, you're going to present your results in a poster session, um, which we do a lot of. 
even in classes, I do it um, so they get some experience. And then it, the, the other one is oral, you know, uh, giving some kind of presentation. Um, aside from that, you, you have to make sure that you're using the accepted style of the appropriate, uh, you know, the, the area of interest. Every area of interest has a professional organization like the APA uh, that uh, they have to uh, adhere to in terms of the guidelines of oral, written, and poster presentations. You know, I kind of did a little research because I was curious myself. I'm very focused in psychology, so I wasn't too sure for any other genres. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, what happens, and Angel, I don't know if you see this too, but I get students who are completely, completely trained in MLA. And, uh, and it's all students know. And then, you know, you can get to the junior or senior level and then nobody has, has learned APA. But yet, as I looked in all these different uh, disciplines, everybody uses APA. So why are we teaching MLA? I don't know. <laughs> That's another. In our, in our case, we, we use for, uh, in, in um, biomedical sciences, we kind of alternate. I think the most common one would be what we call cell, which is very similar to MLA. And uh, it's based on what the journal itself, the journal cell uh, wants to use. But, uh, but that's why a lot of us are trained to just use software to compare between uh, formats, just because it's yeah. journal specific for, for, uh, for disciplines. And that's very true. And, and it's hard because there's a lot of differences, right? I mean, especially between MLA and APA. So it, it takes a little bit of effort, um, but um, for the most part, m most of these major journals are looking at for like an APA, uh, you'll find some exceptions along the way. Um, but, you know, we're, we're so focused on uh, APA sometimes, I don't realize that there's other things. <laughs> so, um, that, that takes a little bit of time. I wish I wish people had a little bit more experience in that before they would start doing their research. But so this just expands a couple of of uh, of couple of those ways of communication. Like I said, uh, written it's really the most critical uh, method of communication is to uh, publish your work in a, what's called a peer reviewed journal, which is uh, a journal that is uh, edited by your peers um, and reviewed. Uh, to determine whether it has any scientific value or if it's worth um, or how you know how how it fits in regarding publication um, again it's the ultimate goal you know it's 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 an accomplishment of your hard work um, and there's a lot of factors goes into it but one misconception is that if i i only can publish work if i find what i anticipated i found and that's not true uh, you don't have to prove your, and no, I shouldn't say prove, you don't, you don't have to have a study that supports your prediction to be published. Uh, there's different reasons that things don't get supported. So uh, there's no bad uh, reason or, or bad outcome that could come of, of your research that it m couldn't make it worthy of, and it's kind of confusing to say, but it, it, you, every finding is a finding, whether it supports yours or not. And, and so a lot of times, if you don't find what you anticipated, most be, most beginning researchers will think, well, it didn't work. Well, yeah, but there's something there and there's a reason why it didn't work. And there's some implications that we can make there and there's an opening for continued research. So keep that in mind that uh, you don't have to have the perfectly run, we have to have perfectly run, but perfect uh, outcome to get something published. Um, the poster, again, is just a visual presentation. It, dis it displays your, uh, your research in terms of different text boxes uh, or tables in a large uh, page. And, uh, you know, you, we often have poster sessions at Cleveland State, which are, I think are wonderful. It's a great way for you to get some experience in presenting the work that you did, um, to talk about it to people, to to explain it to people, um, just to be there and be present uh, to give researchers and, and advisors and, and different students a preview of what you've done and, and you know, what, uh, what you did to get to that point. Um, and then the oral way uh, is basically a great way to reach an engaged audience and you, know, you kind of promote your research. This is hard to do. I'll, I'll never forget, and, and we're reaching the end here, the first time that I took my research as an undergraduate, 
um, to a, I uh, did a, a, a psychological conference at Kent State University. And I have to say, I was absolutely petrified <laughs> to have to take that work that I was so familiar with and so passionate about it, but it took me out of my comfort zone. Um, but it really, from that point on, I never thought I would be a, be teaching about this stuff then, but it really gave me that exposure and that experience that, you know, and, and, and many times after that, it wasn't just one time, but gosh, it made, it really helped, um, me to do, be able to do what I do as much as I fought it. I didn't want to do it, but it really gave me that exposure and I, uh, that experience that I needed to kind of promote myself, my research and really what I wanted to do in life. So, um, a great, uh, a great way to get some of that experience, especially for those who are not really uh, used to it. Um, and then the last thing I, I want to say, the, the last step of the, the scientific method is, uh, you know, now we've completed this circle in a sense. Okay, so we've one more step. Um, you know, you can publish it and you can, you know, do whatever you're going to do to communicate, but. Um, what are we going to say about it in terms of what comes next? And, uh, you know, we might have gotten results that support our hypothesis. Fantastic. We can refine, or other people can refine or expand on your ideas. Okay. The next person that comes along. Uh, the results don't support your hypothesis. That's okay too. We're going to, other people might reformulate it to a new idea. They might uh, find and use a different scale or a different measure or different survey. Uh, somebody can start it over. So, you know, that's kind of, that's what keeps us uh, secular and it's not linear. It, there's no end. And uh, so we, like you said, and so the research continues. So that is it. <laughs> so I hope that was uh, helpful for those who have had some interest so that maybe you could think about doing some research in your future. Uh, and it, like I said, any one of you can do it. It's very doable. Any questions, comments? I have a question on behalf of students. Sure. Uh, for those who may need to get IRB approval, uh, can you give a, a quick overview of how to get around that? Is that something that their mentors will, uh, would have to do? Is that something that they do? It's, so a, it's a process that we would do together. Um, the good thing is that the IRB process has uh, three classifications. You can be exempt from it, but those are very strict guidelines. Uh, then you could be, um, I forgot that it's um, not exempt. It's, it's kind of like your fast, your, it's like getting a fast pass <laughs> at Disneyland. You know, you, you, you kind of step ahead of, of, ahead of line and they don't look at things so closely. And then there's what's called the full review. Um, we fall in the middle uh, because it is, we, we, first of all, we have a time constraint. Um, and usually what we're doing, it, it, it doesn't really push the envelope in terms of ethics. It's, it's again, it still takes, you know, we still have to consider those psychological and emotional risks that need to be, uh, you know, really addressed. But other than that, we, we go through a short review rather than a long review. Um, so the problem is sometimes that the committee doesn't meet all the time, especially in the summer. Um, I've been told that they only meet about once a month. So it really got to kind of make sure that we hit it at the right time. Normally what I do is I will give them a heads up to say here, you know, we're doing this in this period of time and I need IRB approval. Um, and uh, they will usually ex expedite it a little bit. It's a rather long application process that we fill out, but we fill it out together. As a mentor, I help you and I help you develop that because you don't want it to keep coming back because it adds time. And unfortunately, it's really difficult to send it in like be one and done. I mean, you really got to get everything worded right um, and explained properly and thoroughly. So I help you with that so we can hopefully um, kind of get, a, you know, avoid that back and forth, back and forth. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Let this, let this too. Anybody else? Well, I hope that was helpful. It was very Again, just, just let Angel know if you want a copy of that the slides. I don't know if that would be helpful, but if anybody um, is interested or any of the other questions, um, uh, Angel, feel free to give my email. That's good. Thank you very much. So You're very uh, welcome.
thank you for, for doing this because it truly puts the work uh, that's ahead of the scholars into perspective. They, uh, they get a better idea of how the process starts from getting the idea to narrowing what you want based on what you read and then coming up with ideas that are uh, actually testable. So you have like the proper resources and the time right. to, to address. Um, so uh, I have just one more question before uh, I say goodbye, we say goodbye, that is. Um, for students who are interested or, or will have to do work that is, um, that is based on analysis of, of published, previously published work, like a meta type of analysis, a meta analysis. A meta analysis, yeah. Yeah, do you have any, any suggestions for them on how to kind of customize the, the research uh, uh, method, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, I, I actually, I, done a, I did a meta analysis before. Basically what Angel's saying, if I understand it correctly, a meta analysis, you know, there's methods of analyzing data, what we call existing data. So you're not collecting new data, you're using uh, what's out there as your data and uh, in a sense from the literature. And what a meta analysis does is that it takes a, a collective, um, a, a collection, I guess you'd say, of results from studies on a similar uh, 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 variable. I did one on job satisfaction. And uh, so it uses the results from all the studies that were done uh, on job satisfaction and then it, it analyzes that and uses those results as your distribution of data and then analyzes it so that you can kind of come up with an overall, if you will, uh, result. Um, but that's just one way of using existing data. Um, it's a thorough process. Um, it, it does take a lot of time in, term, in, in terms of the literature, uh, but it's very doable, especially in areas that are so uh, well researched and that may have changed over time. Uh, and you really can find out some interesting information by looking at existing data. Um, I haven't done a lot with students uh, of that. I did it myself as a student, but I did not do it with other, I have not done it with other students. I think sometimes they're intimidated by that, you know, because how do I know I'm getting the right thing? How am I, you know, how do, what's enough? Uh, but we would guide you through that for sure. Awesome, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions before we go? I think, I think that's it. Again, thank you very much, uh, Maria, for doing this for our students. Thank you. And it was nice meeting you. I just saw the chat, the little uh, message um, from uh, Jessica. Yes, I'd be happy to get you those slides. And I appreciate your comments. Awesome. Well, thank all you. Right. You guys all enjoy the rest of the semester. Stay safe. You as well. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.